Now to close the show, we're talking around this uh, annual update. It comes from New Zealand's River Water Quality Monitoring Data from Landia Water Aotearoa. And uh, it has found that the more intense of the land use, the more impact it has on health of waterways. We are uh, have wrapped our head around this. There is a lot of talk there around the health of urban waterways. This is not what we're going to touch on too much tonight. These samples were collected over the past 10 years from river sites around the country uh, that show that uh, there are certain catchments still under pressure dominated by pasture management systems and uh, the native vegetation streams. It's worse around our urban waterways. But the challenge to us is, of course, to understand and the farmers and growers that watch Sarah's country, how we can navigate this. Is this data full and true in its entirety? And what about the improvements that we have made over the last 10 years? So joining us now is Chief Scientist for Ag Research involved in our Land and Water National Science Challenge, Rich McDowell. Rich, thank you so much for coming on. I have reached out to you as opposed to, I do have to state, the author, Dr. Roger Young, who has done a fantastic job in his role, more because we do want to bring context around this. This whole claim that our waterways have not improved in the last 10 years, can you explain to our audience, is that fully true? Uh, yeah, well, and, you know, <laughs> in the way that it's presented, um, it is. However, there's a bit of context that needs to be put around this. So there are two things that this, this data shows us. One is the current state, when you quite rightly point out comparison of different land uses, urban probably being the best in the pasture. Than, than forestry and probably native. And then there are trends. Now, the, the way that those are presented, um, they're presented in five-year chunks, okay? And they've just done a rolling average year on year and saying that there's no real change in that. Now, you know, what that's doing, though, is it's collating everything in, into one number and it's also looking at classes. Mm. They've split it up to bands. So A is really good. Um, D is the equivalent of a red card, I'm afraid, uh, and uh, that's the equivalent of bottom lines, I guess, in the current um, policy sphere. Now, a band can be quite large, and so here's the rub. So something like uh, ammonia, um, and you take the C band in there, they, they've coloured it orange, and uh, it varies from about 30 to 240 parts per billion. So even if you were to halve, going from, say, 240 to 120, you still wouldn't qualify as having any sort of change. And so when you look at the data in more depth, um, you can actually see that um, I think this year, it was over a 10 year period, it was 67% of the sites were actually improving in terms of trends, because that was looked at year upon year upon year, as opposed to in a band. So it's a little, it's a little bit more, um, I guess, nuanced than just the, you know, the snapshot that we get. Um, uh, yeah, and also there are other changes as well. I can explain a bit of those too. Yeah, and I think that that is the thing. And the reason I reached out to you is because you do such a great job of taking the headline science and bringing context around it. Now farmers see these things or hear them on talkback radio and go, oh, goodness, all of this work that we've done, and it's not making any difference. Um, what are we making a difference to in the last decade? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So... Um, yeah, you know, outside of, uh, I mentioned just ammonia there, but there are many other um, water quality um, attributes that we, that we measure. And uh, a couple of those, uh, specifically sediment and, and phosphorus, have probably had quite significant improvements um, in the last 10 years. Uh, so, for example, uh, for, for phosphorus, I mean, we started off in a situation from 1994 to 2003 where we had 60% of our sites were worsening. Then it's, it flipped around from 2004 to 2013 where we've now got 60% of the sites improving. And that was largely associated with a number of things. Uh, guidelines around what strategies we could use, recognising that... Um, we put these in the, in the right place at the right time. We call those critical source areas. Those are getting out into industries um, and they're getting out in, into, into farmers' hands and often in the form of farm environment plans. And this is where, I guess, um, some, of the, some of the work has been done in detail in regions like the Horizons region where they've 
they've undertaken the, um, uh, I guess, a number of plans, about half a million um, hectares from memory, and they've planted about 14 million trees. And uh, they're already seeing the green shoots, pun intended of that, that work. Um, they've got sediment there that's projected to go from about 3.1 million to, to 1.6 million tonnes. And uh, the, they've already started seeing um, significant decreases in that sediment load over that, um, that period of time. So, you know, people are doing things. Um, it is working in places. And it gives me confidence, I guess, in the future that we can, we can make more improvement. It does worry me, Rich, and I'm not going to get political with you, but when, you know, you do hear coming out of the ministry, these sorts of things are going to take decades to change. However, our election cycle is three years when we can continue to come back and talk about it. Um, and so, therefore, there hasn't been the breadth and depth of testing. And I know when we talked to Andrew Patterson from Central Otago about the the money being dropped and the pledges being made, yet all they want is an increase in measurement so that they can have a comparable debate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, measurement is quite key, especially when it's been um, touted as uh, regulation. Uh, so, in fact, we always recognise that our current what we call state of environment system um, is not actually up to scratch to, to giving us the measurements and indeed the confidence that we need in order to make changes in our properties and get credit for them. But there is work going on, um, I guess not only by us, but also by the, the ministries and, and other organisations to, to determine what that monitoring system is, such that you can have confidence that, you know, say, a kilometre down from where you are, five k's down, you're actually measuring it and therefore getting credit for it. And I'd like to know, to close, Rich, how do politicians come up with figures and pledges to bring together a single in a plan, which will include a lot, and see out the implementation of it um, with a lack of cap capability to enforce and set out through our councils uh, when we're still just trying to wrap our heads around one, which is the farm environment plan, let alone so many other exercises. I know the work that you do. How, how do you feel about the blurring of the lines and what may become a, a minimum standard for market access and the importance of a farm environment plan stand alone. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see what they're doing. I, I, I listened to your interview with Damien O'Connor yesterday and I, I can I can see it's laudable, okay? You want to reduce the complexity um, and, and bring simplicity, simplicity to it. But I also think, you know, you've got to move it from box ticking through to adding value. And so, you know, not only having that, that one plan that speaks to, to OSH, to animal welfare, to, to, to market access, um, but it, it does it in a way that's seen as an incentive, okay? So where you can incorporate the good things that the industries are doing with their particular farm plans, such that you're able to, to meet your compliance regime, but then leaving alone the areas where they're using it for, for market incentives, for premiums, etc. So yeah, I think there's a bit of work here to be done. And I know the time frame is, is bloody tight. Um, but yeah, we don't want to get into the position where we're, we're just in paralysis, where we're doing nothing. So, but I would like to see, I guess, some flexibility to recognise that, um, you know, we're going to do some stuff. We're not going to get it right in the first instance but uh, to learn from that and adapt and to do that in a, in a time frame that allows us, well, allows, allows everyone to adjust on their property. And so whether that's six months in the current, um, I guess, uh, horizon or whether it's three years, an election cycle or five years, I think we should just get it right and, and have a go in the first instance. 
Rich, it's an absolute pleasure always to have you on Sarah's Country. I, I, lo I love your practicality and pragmatism that you bring to these discussions, and this will not be the last time. Thank you so much. Rich McDowell is the Chief Scientist for Our Land and Waters and based at Ag Research here in Canterbury. Uh, and, of course, head to Our Land and Water for all of the great work that they're doing in this national challenge. I really love following what's going along there. Uh, puts the positive on what what we are doing as a sector. This is Sarah's Country.